I would love to welcome each of you to today's Gems from the Wisdom Traditions here at Still and Moving Center, where we have the opportunity to take up the idea of earning our freedom. And we're very fortunate to have with us someone from the um, tradition of legal justice. And this is Robert or Bob Merce. He has been a long time attorney in Honolulu where he spent his career um, just doing civil cases, mostly in the malpractice field. And till he was asked one time to please help to see if he could get a, a certain inmate released who had already been uh, in prison for two decades and it took Bob yet another two decades to get him a compassionate release when the prisoner was actually near the end of his life. And as soon as Bob did that and people began to realize, hey, there's a champion on our side, his phone began ringing off the wall. Oh, you helped him get free. I really need you to help so-and-so. And so <laughs> it sounds to me as if he has spent a uh, very busy and very worthwhile uh, retirement in, in this uh, kind of endeavor. And he became very concerned as he began working with inmates, evidently, with this idea of creating a more just correctional uh, system than we have currently, and went to Sweden in 2015, no, sorry, Norway. went to Norway in 2015, where he had the opportunity to see what is considered uh, perhaps the world's best correctional um, system. So from his vast perspective of the tradition of legal justice, we're very fortunate to have Bob Merce with us to talk about this idea of earning our freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and, um, and look forward to talking to you individually and, and, and uh, engaging in some dialogue uh, at, at, you know, after I do this brief uh, presentation. Um, I would like to just start out with um, uh, talking a little bit about the, the context for, for my talk, that is some of the uh, information, statistics, data that you may not know regarding our correctional system so that we all have a common understanding of what that is. And, and then look at what um, I, I myself am um, obviously and profoundly not a wise person, but I have found some of the wisdom in the system. And I would like to share some of that with you uh, using the words of others. And, and then talk about how we might move toward um, a better system by sharing a little bit about Norway. So to begin with some of the context for why should we be concerned with our criminal justice system, um, it, I've been involved in it for over 10 years and it's been a very difficult 10 years indeed because we haven't made much progress. The United States has about 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners. Uh, the US continues to incarcerate more of its people on a per capita basis than any country in the world. The incarceration rate in Hawaii is about 390 people per 100,000 population, uh, which is actually very good considering the United this is in the United States. However, that number of 390 per 100,000, if we were a country, would actually put Hawaii within the top 20 incarcerators in the entire world. Hawaii's correctional system includes not only the people who are in prison, but also the people who are on parole and the people who are on probation. And if we include all of them, we have about 27,000 people in Hawaii today who are under some form of correctional supervision, which is an astounding number. We, send people to prison more than just about any country in the world. And yet when we send them to prison, we pay lip service to the idea of rehabilitation, but we do not rehabilitate people in our prison system. And our recidivism rate, which means the number of people who go back into the system after having been in prison, 
uh, demonstrates that and actually proves it because our parolees who come out on parole, uh, over half of them are have either reoffended or uh, over half of them, uh, about 53%, have either reoffended or violated the terms of their parole within three years and are back in, in prison or under some form of supervision. So our system literally fails more often than it succeeds. Um, and of those who do recidivate, 63% uh, do so within 12 months, and by 24 months, 90% of them have done it. So it isn't like they, you know, the prison has such a terrible effect on people that they, you know, conform to the law when they get out. In fact, within two years, most of them who are going to reoffend have already reoffended. So the system just is a terrible failure on that count. Um, we have the idea that the prison system is full of a bunch of really bad, dangerous uh, people. I had that view myself, I think. Um, but the reality is that 74% of our uh, combined jail and prison population at the present time is made up of people who are, have committed the lowest level of felony or even lower offenses. That is, uh, very minor offenses, uh, the, the main one being uh, drug, drug possession which in Hawaii, any amount of a prohibited drug is a, is a felony um, and, and, and carries a, uh, a, a, up to a 10 year uh, prison, a, a five year prison sentence. And so um, we have a, an awful lot of people there are, are, are people who are there for either property crimes of theft or for drug offenses. Native Hawaiians make up about 18% of our adult population in Hawaii they make up nearly 40% of our prison population. And all of our prisons are old, nearly all of them are old, dilapidated, and, and, and in terrible condition and overcrowded. So those, uh, those are sort of the facts that we're dealing with, and they come from, all of those facts are in a report that I, uh, I wrote for the uh, Hawaii, um, uh, it's called the HCR 85 Task Force on Prison Reform uh, two years ago. Um, Leo Toy Tolstoy said the degree of civilization in a society can be judged by entering its prisons. And I believe that is really true. And if you do enter our prisons and look at how we treat people and the conditions that we confine them under, uh, you have to say that our degree of civilization could uh, be improved a, a great deal. So how are we to think about the correctional system and the people who are in it and, and how we view it? Uh, that has been really one of the things that I've given the most thought to over the past 10 years. And as I said, I don't have any great wisdom, but uh, I have found some uh, what I believe to be correct um, assessments of, of what is going on. And one of them is from Brian Stevens, who most of, many of you may know he wrote a book called um, A Just Mercy, and it was made into a movie. He, he had defended um, people uh, can, uh, who are facing the death penalty for many years, and he's a real hero of mine. And I think the problem is that because most of us don't have that much connection with people who are in prison, we really see them as other. We don't see them as part of our community, as part of our family, as, as part of us. They become uh, truly others and, and, and not part of our, our sphere of compassion. And, and I think that is, is what leads us, um, uh, leads us down the wrong road and leads us to a lot of problems. Um, Brian Stevenson said, and I quote, I've come to understand and to believe that each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. I believe that for every person on the planet. I think if somebody tells a lie, they're not just a liar. I think if somebody takes something that belongs, doesn't belong to them, they're not just a thief. I think even if you kill someone, you're not just a killer. And because of that, there's this basic human dignity that must be respected in the law. He goes on to talk about the fact that most of us the people who are in the prison system are broken in some way, and so are we if we would come to recognize it. And therefore that becomes a common bond between us and them. Because one of the things that I have really come to understand is that there's such a fine line between the people who are in prison and the people who are not. 
that uh, there but for the grace of God go any of us, uh, myself included. And I have found some of the, the people with the most integrity and the people I respect them a great deal in the prison system, um, which, which may come as a surprise to some people, but um, I, I found them to be very honest and, 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 and very authentic and, and I, you know, I can trust them. And uh, uh, I, I think there's a lot to be said for them and that they are, you know, they are really, really good people who do have not had a chance. Um, he talks about uh, another one of the people that I respect a great deal is Greg, Father Greg Boyle, who uh, you, you, you may know him too. Um, he, he's, a, a, I think, a Franciscan friar, or a, I'm not sure which denomination, but he's a, a, um, um, a father, a, a, a Catholic priest in, in LA who works with gang members. Sure. And I'd like to, he, he, I think, really has, has hit it in, in exactly on the head in so many ways. Um, he, he said, and, and this is, he says this uh, uh, about the people that he's working with. He says, here is what we seek, a compassion that can stand in awe of what the poor people have to carry with them, rather than stand in judgment as to how they carry it. And I think that says a lot about the issue that we're facing. He says in another quote that I think is very important and, and really illustrates why we have so many problems in our correctional system. He says, there should be no daylight separating us, only kinship. Inching ourselves closer to creating the community of kinship such that God might recognize. And soon we, we imagine with God the circle of compassion. Then we imagine that no, no, imagine no one standing outside of that circle, moving ourselves closer to the margins so that the margins themselves will be erased. We stand there with those whose dignity has been denied. We locate ourselves with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless. At the edges, we join the easily despised and the readily left out. We stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop. And we situate ourselves right next to the disposable so that one day, the day will come when we will stop throwing people away. I'm afraid what our correctional system does is throw people away. We lock them up for a long period of time, but we make little or no effort to really rehabilitate them and give them a second chance and help them get back into the community. There are ways to do that. One is restorative justice, and we have some of that in Hawaii. <clears throat> restorative justice focuses primarily on repairing the damage that's caused by wrongful action and restoring insofar as possible the well-being of all of the people involved, that is the victim and the perpetrator. Um, we don't have them in Hawaii, but in Canada, they have a, a, a something called sentencing circles where if, if somebody who is an, an indigenous person, uh, one of the First Nation people commits a crime, uh, the, the sentencing is, is carried out in a very different way with uh, the advice and input from the elders in the, uh, in the first uh, Native American or, or First uh, Nation uh, people, uh, weighing in and trying to find the right uh, solution, the right sentence for the person who uh, has been found to be guilty of a crime. Australia has indigenous, indigenous courts for uh, the, uh, the uh, indigenous people there. And those courts specifically are allowed to take into account the colonialism and the suffering and the hardships that have come to be inflicted on the Aboriginal people of Australia in, in issuing sentences. Um, and, and I think that's a, a very interesting, another interesting approach. And in Hawaii, we do have treatment courts, which are also a step in the right direction, where we try and find treatment solutions for people rather than simply punishing them. With that, um, I, I think when we take a look at our correctional system and, and try and improve it, the best model that I know of, the wisest model, the, 
the, uh, the, the gem of knowledge, I think, is in the, in the Norwegian system, which I had the opportunity to, uh, to see. And, and so I'd like to do this very short PowerPoint and just talk to you a little bit about, uh, about, about the, the system there. This is called Holden, Holden Prison in Norway, a radical, humane, maximum security prison. Um, these are the grounds of Holden Prison in, in, in Norway. Uh, the, the place is secured not by barbed wire fences or concertina wire, uh, but there is a tall concrete wall that goes all the way around the facility. And that wall separates the prisoners from the outside world. And it has motion sensors on it. But it looks like this. And it is a constant reminder that the people inside have lost their freedom. But it is also a, a, a kind of a, as benign a way as you can think of to uh, enforce that, letting them know that there are boundaries, but uh, they're not made with iron and steel. Uh, the, the trees would normally be a security risk in any correctional facility in the United States, but of course they'd be, they've become an integral part of the philosophy of the Halden prison, which is to bring nature and natural world into the, into the prison system. And you can see there are some of the men sitting out there um, watching the, uh, uh, you know, uh, talking or playing a game and just sitting there and enjoying it. And you, you can just see the architecture is really focused on uh, rehabilitation rather than punishment. This is what a cell, so-called cell, looks like in, in the Norwegian system. Um, you can see that that's a very big man. He's got a very large room that he occupies all by himself. Um, you can't see because he's got a towel over, uh, looks like a towel over the window. But there's a huge long window there with a lot of natural light coming in. The furniture is made out of uh, wood, light wood. Um, and it's a very humane environment. Um, and this picture shows the part of the cell looking toward the door. And you can see um, he's got a little flat screen TV there. Uh, that little black thing is a flat screen TV. Uh, just beyond that is a closet with a, a refrigerator, and, and just beyond that is the doorway to his private bathroom, which has a toilet and a wash basin and a shower. And he also has a key to that room because it's his and his personal effects are there. And he takes care of it and is expected to take care of it and keep it clean and neat and, um, and, and has responsibilities for it. But this is how they house the people in, in Holden Prison. Those cells, 10 of the cells, every 10 cells opens into an area like this, which is a common area that these 10 men share. Each has their own room, uh, as you just saw, but the 10 of them share this common area. And you can see in the back, it's got a kitchen where they get together and they buy their food and they take turns cooking their evening meals. Nobody waits on them. They don't go to a mess hall. They cook their own food. They decide what they're going to buy. They have to budget their own money because they work and they get paid. It's, it, the idea is to make the life in the prison as much like on the outside as possible. Um, you can see down below here, they use knives, forks, and spoons. Um, those would never be allowed in an American prison like this. Um, uh, a metal fork, uh, which you know could be used for lethal purpose, kill somebody, but in, in, in Norway, they do use it. Um, this is actually a picture. I did see this myself in, in one of the facilities there. Um, the, the knives that the inmates are trusted to use. Um, uh, and this is maximum security, mind you. Um, they, use, they, they, have, they have access to these types of things. And then this is a, another picture of that common room where they're, you know, they're playing a video games. There's a 60 inch TV in those rooms. Uh, there are magazines, um, and, and this is where they relax and, um, and uh, in, in addition to cooking and eating. However, if you look on the top right picture, you can see in the back, there's a, like a window and there are guards inside that window and they do keep an eye on what's going on. The vocational training, I misspelled it. I just did this uh, PowerPoint. I made it up today kind of at the last minute. So excuse my misspelling there. There, there it should be vocational training. It's very, very sophisticated. Uh, this is a picture of their 
sheet metal shop uh, where they train people to be metal, 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 work, metal workers. Um, and it's very sophisticated. They don't teach you the, you know, this, you know, stuff that's never going to be useful. They teach them how to use these computer operated machines and so forth. Uh, the, auto the auto repair um, is, is, again, very, very sophisticated, very well done. They really do get an education. Uh, they have a huge, almost like an airplane hangar that is their uh, wood shop. And again, they teach the men how to use these like big, huge saws that are used to make commercial um, furniture and to operate those uh, computerized saws so that they, you know, they can do this on the outside in furniture manufacturing plants. Norwegian furniture and Swedish furniture, Nordic furniture is very popular. And the prison here makes all of the um, desks and tables and bookshelves for um, the government of, of Norway. Uh, the men make it very sophisticated. And this last little slide, the blue one on the right, is part of the metal shop. And uh, what, what you really see, there are a bunch of, um, uh, of wrenches and there's some files and everything. So as somebody said, when we were looking at that, you don't have to bake a cake and smuggle the file in. It's, it's right there for you to pick up if you want it and just yeah, take it back to your room. Um, there are a lot of amenities in the system to make it humane on the left. The left two pictures are, they call it the records bureau. Um, but what, what they mean, it's a play on the English word records. Um, they, they make records here. They make uh, DVDs or CDs. And uh, they have a, uh, the, the, the various bands that men have formed in the prison. And uh, they can get together, they can play their music and they can record it and make recordings, send it to their family. Um, the picture next to that, they have a climbing wall. Below that, they have a, a really, really beautiful uh, gymnasium. They have a first rate library, which uh, is run by the Norwegian library system. And they can, if, if you don't see something you want in their library, they will get it for you no matter where it is in Norway. They, they will, you know, they'll write to any other library and, and bring the material in for you. Um, and likewise, their TV system, when, and they have the TV in their room, they can get any channel that all of the civilians can get. And on the right is just a nice picture of their uh, chapel. <laughs> in this facility, um, everyone thinks that everything works so smoothly because they're all homogenized, you know, homogenous group of people. But actually, there's, I think, 149 nationalities represented in, you know, in, this, uh, in this prison, including some very, very tough characters that were, uh, have been arrested for smuggling um, that belong to Russian uh, gangs. Um, and, um, and, and there are also some Muslims. Uh, so they have to accommodate, uh, you know, various religions, various uh, 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 diets, and, 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 and they respect all that and do it very well. Um, this is just a, 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 an amazing picture of their minimum security prison after you, you know, graduate from the, the, uh, uh, the maximum security prison, you can go to a minimum security prison. This only houses 120 people, and it's the first choice of almost everybody, and then all the Norwegian prisoners want to go to this one because it's probably the nicest. It's on a little island, um, uh, out, uh, um, and uh, the inmates run the ferry that goes between the mainland and the island. It only takes about 10 minutes to get there. It used to be a village. The Nazis took it over during World War II, and after the war, it, came, it, re it reverted to the government. The government turned it into a prison. And take a look at that. I mean, that is a prison. Um, they, 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 they grow their own food. They grow food to sell. Uh, it's all organic. They have horses. They have sheep. They use the manure to, 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 to uh, fertilize their fields. Um, they do most of the harvesting by, you know, with horses and in an old-fashioned way. Um, it, it's, it's just... It's just totally amazing. Um, they live in, this is one of the houses that the inmates live in. Each man has got their own room and, um, and they run it by themselves. They, they have a, a cook up there. You know, the biggest problem they said they're having now is they have every, every one of these units has a grill outside for the summer and everyone loves to go out and grill. 
and the you know the 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 some of the men want to eat meat and they grill it outside. Well, that screws everything up for the Muslims who don't want that certain meats on that grill. And so they're trying to resolve those types of problems. But those are the kinds of problems I wish we had here instead of the ones we do have. Um, this is kind of a radical picture. Many of these houses are very old and they're heated. Okay, I'll, I'll be done in two seconds. Um, there's, they're, um, they're heated with the wood. And the inmates uh, go out in, the, out in the woods and they have the horses and they have these wagons, they cut down the trees they, and they plant new trees and, and, and they use chainsaws. Now, when is the last time you saw an American prison with a chainsaw in, a, in an inmate's hand? Um, and they have their horses. And this is a picture that just drives everybody crazy. But, you know, they do have, they have a hard day. They work hard. They're expected to be very responsible. At the end of the day, they do have a chance to relax and go fishing or swimming if the water's warm enough, which it usually isn't, uh, or to sunbathe. And, and um, that's part of life. And, and it, inmates do it as well as anybody else. But the, in showing people this picture, I get these incredible reactions of, how could this be uh, that this is a prison? But that's what, this is to me what the, the future of Hawaii hopefully someday will look like. Uh, I think this is one of the gems of knowledge uh, uh, in, the, in this tradition of, of, uh, of rehabilitation that we will adopt and, and move in this direction as soon as we can. Oh, I just have one more, one more thing I, I, I'd like to share with you briefly and maybe see what you think of this. Um, most people don't know this, but we have we have one little law that, um, that I think is very important, but it's never cited. I've never heard a judge refer to it. It's called Hawaii Revised Statute Section 5-7.5. And it says, among other things, the aloha spirit is the coordination of mind and heart within each person. It brings each person to the self. Aloha is more than the greeting or farewell or a salutation. Aloha means mutual regard and affection and extends warmth and caring with no obligation in return. Aloha is the essence of relationships in which each person is important. Each person is important to every other person for collective existence. Aloha means to hear what is not said, to see what cannot be seen, and to know the unknowable. In exercising their power on behalf of the people, and in fulfillment of their responsibilities, obligations, and service to the people, the legislature, governor, lieutenant governor, executive officers of each department, the chief justice, associate justices, and judges of the appellate, circuit, and district courts may contemplate and reside with the spirit, the, with the life force, and give consideration to the Aloha spirit. So I just. You know, if we really took that statute to heart, if our leadership did, if our legislators did, if they understood, as the statute says, that the, uh, the, uh, each person is, is really dependent for their collective existence on the others, um, I would be so much better off. So I guess what, one of the questions I'd like to ask um, is, is, you know, how, how do, how do how do how should we react, or how do you see the people who who commit crimes and end up in the criminal justice system? How how do do you view them as part of our community, or are they other? Are they separate? Are, how do we work that out, and how can we work that out better uh, so that, that they are not seen as as someone who, as, as uh, Father Boyle said, uh, beyond the circle of our compassion. I thought you were going to answer that. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on answering that, but I don't have an answer today. <laughs> I'm just wondering, do I have to kill somebody to get into that prison? <laughs> well, <laughs> no, you don't. You just have to commit a crime. Uh, okay. But um, it, it's uh, an another uh, uh, another fact about that prison is if you want to work in the prison, you don't apply to go to work in the prison. You go, you apply to an academy. And if you're accepted in the academy, which is very, very uh, selective, 
Um, you, 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 you go to school basically at the academy for two full years before you're allowed to work in the prison. You learn about human rights, about, about, uh, about civil rights, about um, de-escalation. You learn their correctional philosophy. You learn how to help people and develop the skills to work with people uh, as, as part of your training. And, and that's, that's why people don't come back to that system. They, they serve their time, they get out, and most of them don't come back like we do. I think you said they have uh, about a 20% rate, whereas yeah. ours is over 50%. Yes, you have a terrific memory, Renee. You remembered everything I said yesterday very precisely, and uh, I'm amazed. But yes, that's exactly right. They're about 20%. And uh, their system's very expensive, but they spend the money up front and they really rehabilitate people. They really help people. They see their role as helping people. And they feel a personal failure when somebody recidivates and comes back into the system. They don't say, oh yeah, we knew this guy would be back. They say, what did we do wrong? What, how did we fail them? What could we have done to have prevented this? And they, they take it very, very seriously. Robert, so I have a question about that the uh, Norway system. Do they, um, they must, uh, I imagine, distinguish between, say, very violent crimes, um, and and so that's a, that's a question. Do they make a distinction between the type of crime and then what is appropriate in terms of uh, rehabilitation in relation to that crime? Yes. And one of the, uh, just to add a little bit to it, the, uh, one of the things I've heard about American prisons is that there's some significant percentage of, uh, of folks who are in prison who also have some form of, um, you could say, uh, mental disability, a dysfunctional, uh, you know, uh, capacity, and, and, rather than that being treated, you know, they're just thrown into the same mixes with the other prisoners. So it seems like that also would be uh, a consideration, right? If someone has yeah. a, like a psychotic condition um, that needs treatment, that that would put them in a special category. I'm just wondering if there's some differentiation between folks like that. Yeah, I, 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 they do take into account the, the nature of the offense, you know, in, in looking at the whole situation. Um, they, uh, they do have people who are kind of, I think, borderline, <clears throat> um, but they don't have really psychotic people in there at all. Um, and everybody, no matter what their offense, starts off in a high level of security. In other words, there's a little part of the prison where you come in at the very beginning and you have to earn your way out of there. So you stay there and when you demonstrate that you, you know, are ready to be released to a, a lower level of custody, um, then you're released to a lower level and, and your privileges keep increasing gradually the entire time that you're in the facility so that um, the, the inmates don't have uniforms, for example, they, they wear street clothes and they buy their clothes. And if they, they you know, if, if you, even though these are maximum security prisoners, if the inmate says, look, I need new clothes, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've got a good record in here, I wanna go out and buy, go shopping, the, you know, the person who's working with them will take them shopping. And, uh, and uh, they, 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 toward the end, before they go to a minimum security prison, they often release them for weekends or a week or two weeks of furlough, and they all come back. You know, um, they, nobody escapes. Nobody tries to escape. There are no, I, one of the people we were with, they said, well, when's the last time you saw an inmate hit a guard? And they said, well, I've never seen that. Now, it just doesn't happen because Everybody is working together. They're all in touch with each other all the time. Problems get identified and resolved before they get to the violent stage 99% of the time. Um, and if somebody does have a sort of a mental breakdown, they do have cells that are made to do that so that they can uh, extract them and take them there 
and get them mental health treatment. But they don't really house people with severe mental illness in these facilities. I mean, when I, I mean, you know, in American prisons, it's just so different. I mean, you really feel, I'm a, you know, I, every time I go in the prison, I, you're on edge. Um, in, in Norway, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, I, I just, I really, I just did not feel any tension at all. I mean, it's just radically different. Just Robert, really may I ask a question? Sure. Thank you. Um, uh, having been involved in a number of programs, um, evolutionary kinds of programs within the prison system here, both with the Women's Correctional Center um, over in Kailua and also at OCC. Tell me, um, as a counselor, tell me what you think it would take to incorporate or present, because I know very well the past head of the prison system here, the statistics that you've brought forward are so compelling. What do you think are the, um, the problems associated with, let's just say here in Hawaii, with not implementing something like this? You said on the front end, it's very expensive, but if you do a spreadsheet over a period of five or 10 years, you obviously see the cost savings with people not returning. What do you think it would take to actually implement something like this and bring a consensus with those who are in a position to do something so that um, a program like this could go forward? That's a really, really good question. And I think there are are a number of things. One is when um, we went to uh, Norway, it was me um, and also uh, Mike Wilson from the Hawaii Supreme Court went, and Greg Takayama, who was then the chair of the Public Safety Committee in the House, went, uh, the chair of the parole board, Bert Matsuoka at that time, went, and somebody from Public Safety went. And when we came back, uh, we said, what are we going to do? We've got this, this, this we need to change our system. And so they, Greg Takayama introduced a resolution called HCR, House Concurrent Resolution 85 to, uh, uh, among other things, set up uh, what, they, what, what was called the Hawaii uh, Correctional Oversight Commission. And the primary role of the Oversight Commission is to, is to oversee the transition of Hawaii to a, from a punitive to a rehabilitative system. Um, the, there, um, I think, are five members of the commission. One pointed by the House, uh, by the Speaker of the House, the President of the Senate, the Governor, the Chief Justice, and the Office of Wine Affairs. And they were appointed uh, two years ago, I guess, in in, uh, uh, in June after the, the the bill creating the Oversight Commission passed. It's called Act 179. And the governor never released the money for their funding. They, 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 the, the legislature appropriated, I think, 300,000, 350,000. And, and I mean, I was just, it just boggled my mind. All the money we could save if we start changing our system. Did you, what, did you contest that uh, lack of action? What did you do to get those monies released? We, we, well, we, 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 you know, a, a lot of people wrote and talked to and called the governor and, and things like that. But what was his um, position that he would stop it? Yeah, I don't, I, we never got, he never responded to us or to the commission. Um, uh, but it would, I mean, the, the major reason that was put out was it was, it, it came very close after he delayed it. And then the, um, from like July and then um, 2019, and then in January, February, the COVID hit. And, and then that became the, you know, that became the excuse is the, you know, the state is, uh, we got a hiring freeze and all this kind of stuff. Um, he has now released the money. Uh, uh, so one thing that we, we need to do is to really, it, but they haven't hired their, uh, their staff yet. Once, they, once the Oversight Commission hires their staff, then I think they will be able to start holding the Department of Public Safety accountable 
And I've been ar arguing with them or asking them or encouraging them to say, look, every, every month that you, they only meet once a month. I think they should meet every two weeks or if not every week, but they're volunteers. <clears throat> and I said, you know, you need to every week have a report from the Department of Public Safety. What have you done in the last 30 days to move us toward a rehabilitative system? What, what are the specific things that you've done? <clears throat> we all need to get together and start putting pressure on them and, and, and our legislators. I mean, we're, we're about to, you know, they want to spend over 500 million to build a new jail. And everybody knows that, 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 that we don't need that big jail. We wouldn't need it if we would only get bail reform. Bail, our bail system is, is immoral. It is unethical. It, it can't be justified because it keeps poor people in jail, even if they're innocent, and lets people who are rich get out, even if they're guilty, as long as they got money. Can so, I ask a question that, sure. uh, that is right on point with that? If we were to be honest, I think that a $500 million new jail, and you know it's going to be double that for sure yeah. when it's finished or more. Um, sad to say, but uh, the unions and politics and people that benefit from the building of, you know, something with that kind of price tag attached to it, aren't just going to fall asleep at the wheel. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're in the governor's office promoting their point of view, and it becomes like the rail this absurd, yes. ridiculous decision that put a lot of people to work and who ends up paying for it, you and I. But it's all about politics and uh, people in power and who gets benefited from building a $500 million billion dollar, uh, facility. So I see that's really the problem. And these stalling techniques are ridiculous, hoping that people will run out of gas and just go away. It's something that could have been implemented in five minutes. And the COVID nonsense is ridiculous that that's what's stalling people. The whole thing is a big shabai. And I'd like to know if we're all honest, how can we overcome that? Well, um, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm working on a plan, uh, a written plan. What can we do to stop the new jail? And to stop the, huh? you said, to, what can we do to stop the? To, to stop, yeah. Well, I don't really want them to stop building a new jail. OCCC, as you know, because it sounds like you've been there, is, is a terrible place. We need a jail. Uh, unfortunately, but it, it, we need a really small jail for the really few people who are dangerous and really should not be released. Um, That's right. There are those people. I mean, I'm not a complete abolitionist. I'm, I'm, I'm real, you know, old enough and real enough to know that there are people who are really dangerous and and and, and we shouldn't release them pre-trial. Um, but 90% of the people could be released. And last year, the legislature passed a bill, um, Senate Bill 1290, that would have been a first step. And it, it, it did eliminate uh, money bail for low-level offenses that were nonviolent, misdemeanors and petty misdemeanors that were nonviolent. That's a, a really, really, really baby step. But OK, I'll take it. And um, it passed both houses. And, um, and, and then uh, at, at, at the last minute in the conference committee, uh, Apparently, the attorney general stepped in and said, no, this is a bad idea. And they panicked and they, uh, they did not pass the bill out. So it, it didn't make it to the governor's desk. But, um, so but do the you first see step- the pattern, Robert, do you see the pattern of how everything gets stopped at the last moment? Yeah. Oh, and God, I do. And that pattern over a I, period of years and years and years and many with many different projects, uh, not even related to prisons, you realize that somebody is, you know, or groups of powerful people are pulling the strings. I salute you for still having a full tank of gas to get this done. But what's the reality of it, honestly? Because you see the pattern. 
And, and I, I'd love to have some other people have a chance to also make some new suggestions, perhaps. Uh, I'd love to hear your suggestions, Bob. Uh, you know, you had a, you said you had to come up with a new plan. What are the couple bullet points on the plan and uh, how can we help? The, okay, the, I guess the bullet points uh, would be, we need to get together a core group of people who, who care about the issue and, and are willing to educate themselves look at some of the data and, and the uh, studies and research that's been done on jails um, and, and, uh, and bail reform, which is a key element in building a smaller jail. Then we need to get that information out by, by social media. We need people to start going to, uh, uh, you know, we, then we have to do community organizing, basically. We need to go to the legislature. We need to go to the legislator's constituents. We may need to go to the neighborhood boards. And I've gone to a bunch of them. I hate it. You have to sit through, oh, God, so much just to get up and talk for a couple of minutes. Just, you know. But we got to go to the neighborhood boards. We got to go to the Lions Clubs. We got to go to, um, to, to the Chamber of Commerce. We've got to go to all the organizations and talk to them about how irrational this process is. Um, and I, I, and so that the, when the, if we can build some momentum and start getting, and, and we need to write, of course, I, I've written a bunch of um, things for Civil Beat and for the Star Advertiser, but we need to do more of that, um, the op-ed pieces. Um, we, uh, those are, the, you know, basic organizing techniques that um, go to the labor unions and see if we can get some of them on our side. It's not going to be easy. Um, but we've got to convince the legislators that um, the legislature now is not going to appropriate $500 million for a new jail. What they're going to do, and this is insidious, is they're going to, uh, the department is going to strike a deal, what they call a public partner, private partnership with some private company. And the, the most logical thing that we anticipate is they will say, look to this company, you, we'll, we've got the land, you build the jail. You own the jail. You lease it back to us for 50 years. And, and after 50 years, um, you know, for 50 years, we'll pay you for it. And then we'll own it at the end of that process. Of course, after 50 years, it won't be worth anything, but we will own it. Uh, and that way, uh, we will not have to come up with the uh, capital to, to build this new jail. We'll have to, all we'll have to come up with is the lease rent every year. And, um, and, and I mean, to me, that just, that's just a crazy way of doing things, but that's the direction they're going. Um, I have had talks with Sylvia Luke, who told me personally, she said, look, we are not going to appropriate and float a bond for $500 million for a new jail. But I said, well, will you pass a law that says with regard to the corrections, it, would, it will be unlawful to do a public-private partnership to build it. And oh, well, no, no, I'm not going to do that. So that's what's going to happen. That's what we're, work, we're working against is this public-private partnership concept. But basically, we're talking about the, the old-fashioned community organizing, political organizing to stop the jail. OK, thank you. Um, Sarah, did you want to weigh in here? Thank you, Robert, for bringing your insights and, and what you do. And I think it is, it's a service to us as a whole, as a society, the work that you're doing. Because really, we can say that, oh, these are just the others and these other people. But if we were to pause and look a little deeper in humanity, we cannot be separate from the whole. And so I believe they are, they are our brothers and sisters, just like each of us are each other's brothers and sisters. And to neglect and turn the other like cheek and not pay attention to this issue is a collective problem. And I believe how we do one thing is how we do all things, more or less. And so that collective problem will manifest in all kinds of issues with humanity that we're getting to experience. And so for our evolution as society, as people working together, we need these, we need people like you, we need somebody to stand up there and try to keep the momentum in, and there's so many different directions in society to activate ourselves and help activate others towards bringing a change. So thank you for the work that you're doing. And it's wonderful to hear about what's going on in Norway and see that there really is a potential and changing a system is such a task to take on, but we must learn how to change a system. It's a gradual process. 
Yeah. I might, might add that since we went to Norway, it was 2015, um, a number of um, states have sent people to Norway. Um, we were there with North, uh, North Dakota. Yeah, North Dakota. And um, when they came back, the, their director was there. She's very, it was a woman, she's very smart. And, and she um, immediately made arrangements to bring one of the key people from Halden Prison over to Norway to help her set up a whole new system. And, and North Dakota was a very, very red state, is one of the most progressive states in, in the country right now because they are, they are doing their best to follow the Norwegian model. And lo and behold, Idaho, which is another very red state, is also making some strides. They, I think, have gone to Norway, some of their people. They know what the Norwegian model holds. Uh, New York is beginning to look into the, New York, into the Norwegian model. Um, Hawaii, we were one of the first states to go and see it, and we are not doing anything to implement uh, and, and to try and take their wisdom and apply it over here. It's really frustrating. Cliff. Well, three minutes. Go for it, Cliff. <laughs> I was really struck by your, your quote from Leo Tolstoy about you can measure a society by the state of its prison, something of those lines. Yeah. Bob, I, when you were starting to talk about practical things of what to do, uh, I've been a union contractor pretty much my whole life in construction, and all the unions have apprenticeship programs. And uh, so I've, and I just recently hired three apprentices to our company. I was wondering, it seems like the ruling principle of the Norwegian system is reintegration, where our ruling principle is just punishment, plain and simple. And I was wondering if, it would be possible to uh, create some kind of ambassadorship or mediatorship between the unions and um, the, the prison system, whereby people that do get incarcerated could make choices as to what they might want to do as a livelihood when they came out. And while they're in prison, they could begin an apprenticeship program uh, that would be incorporated through a lot of the unions, because I assume a lot of these folks are blue collar. Well, what about some idea like that? Oh, I, I think yeah, there's a, that is a, I think is a great idea. I'm, I would love to see something like that. Um, they have some programs, but I'm not that familiar with them, but I just, I mean, I've never seen anybody talk about, or I've never had any, any sense that there's any kind of a decent uh, vocational program going on at, at, at any of our facilities. So um, that would be that would be absolutely great. Um, and, and if the unions would be willing to go in and, and work with those people. And you know, a lot of those people, uh, the people who are in prison reaching toward the end of their sentence, they could be furloughed to go out and start working with union people. Um, and, and you know, there, I mean, the potential is there to do so much, uh, Cliff. Uh, uh, you're absolutely right. It's a wonderful idea. Okay, thank you. I'll I'll, I'll look into it. <laughs> okay, I, I I'll help you in any way I can. Wow, it's such a, a vast topic. It feels like you know we would love to have so much more time to look at this. I would like to look at what's the source. What are the underlying things that are going on that cause us to begin with to. Um, think that it's okay to put so many of our people into prisons. So, you know, that's, I know, a future discussion, but um, certainly you have brought a wealth of insight into what the problem is, as well as pointing to some wonderful examples of solutions that we could move toward, number one, and number two, are completely in alignment with Hawaiian principles such as the Aloha Spirit Law, right? Yeah. So um, it, it's been an extremely valuable, valuable um, conversation for us to engage in here, Bob. And um, I know it's going to really get wheels turning uh, for all of us when we think about these people who are our brothers and sisters there but for the grace go yes, on exactly right. exactly it could be my brother it could be my myself who's there how would i want to be treated I, how would i want my brother treated 
how would I want them to earn their freedom out instead of being sent out, as you told me, with a green trash bag with all of their worldly goods, not a cent in their hand and, and released just out into the world when they finally do get free. So the follow through program as well, once they have achieved some sort of freedom. Thank you ever so much on behalf of Still a Moving Center, Gems from the Wisdom Traditions uh, for your really illuminating and inspiring uh, contribution to uh, Hawaiian society and to the idea of what's truly fair. Thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to you and to uh, join in the conversation with you. I appreciate <laughs> it very much. So could we all thank Bob for an absolutely wonderful and uh, inspiring presentation. Thank Thanks, everybody. Bob. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Hello. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. And thank you. And Aloha. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you.